Good morning, Grace Life. It's good to be with you again this morning. Isn't it good um, to have Jesse back leading us in worship? It's so, I was just telling him I'm so thankful that he gives his time and his heart. So it's, it's great. We have great people that lead when he's not here, um, but it's just good to have him back. And it's good to be back. We are continuing our series in Ephesians 1 in Christ, and we've been looking at, since chapter 4, we've been looking at this walk in Christ, meaning Paul told told us, walk in a manner worthy of your calling, that the Christian life in the first three chapters was all about the life that God placed into us and all the blessings we have in Christ, and that all of it is founded on the work of Jesus. And he spent three chapters teaching us the treasure chest, the riches that are ours by possession in Jesus Christ. And they're amazing. But then he concludes in these final three chapters, now what do we do with all we've been given? What do we do now that we have Christ? We walk differently. We walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And if there's anything this world needs, it is for the church, the body of Christ, the people of God to know who they are and whose they are and walk like it. That's what brings transformation, not just in our own lives, but that's what brings the transformations in other people that recognize what's different about us. That's what this world needs. So we saw last week in chapter 4, he told us that we are to be renewed in the spirit of our minds, that we have put off the old and we put on the new. In a sense, in, in a spiritual sense, the old you, the one that showed up, in Adam, dead, separated from God, that person died. And we put away the life of that person in the sense of the patterns, the propensities, the the potentials that that life exhibited. We put that away. It's not us anymore. We're a new creation. And we put on the new. And this happens by the reality of Christ in us. And we apply it. We, We appropriate this. We walk after this when we are renewed in the spirit of our mind. Meaning we think differently now. We, we didn't learn Christ in that old way. We've learned Christ in this new way. So we, we are renewed in the spirit of our mind to put on the new. And I love this part. The new self. And look at this new self. Look who you are. Which is being renewed, which is in the likeness of God. The new you that God created you to be in Christ. Child of God, saint, holy one. The new you is made in the likeness of God. Incredible. What duped Adam and Eve at the very beginning, what they had failed to remember and realize at the moment of temptation, that they were already made in God's image and likeness. They got tempted to be like God, whom they were already like. It's a strategic old way of the enemy to tempt us at the level of our identity. And then we fell in Adam. It says when he sinned, we sinned. When he became a sinner, we became a sinner. When he was condemned, we were condemned. And in that condemnation, we showed up on planet earth, separated from God, a sinner. But in Christ, by faith, because of his grace, we have been made brand new creations And that brand new creation that you now are in Christ is in the likeness of God. It's crazy. That that we, when we look in a mirror, we see our own image reflected. But, But when we look in the spiritual mirror of Christ, he sees his image reflected in us. We are fused together with him. Created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You're a brand new person. This has to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. It's been placed into our heart. And now it has to take the one foot journey from our heart into our mind, into our thinking processes. So that when we actually go affect this out in real time and in real life with real temptation, with real opposition, we can appropriate, we can apply what's true about us. Not based on feelings, but based on what we know to be true in Christ. 
We are renewed in the spirit of our mind. And just like we said last week, the old adage, whatever you are, what you eat, that's true in a physical sense. I made the joke, I I would be an Oreo. I, I would be a lot of other things as well, just to let you know. In a relational sense, in a behavioral sense, you are what you believe. You're going to live out what you believe about yourself. And if you believe you're still that old self, dirty, rotten, separated, evil at the core, you'll live this way. But if you believe what God says, that you've been made brand new from the core, that you're a righteous creation of His, you begin to live differently. And that's Paul's heart in these last three chapters. That in knowing whose you are and who you are, we learn how to depend on him in our walk. If you are in Christ, you are a whole new person. We live in a broken world. You recognize that. You see the events and the times that we live in, and it's obvious to see that the ways and the systems of this world are broken. There is no system of this broken world that can fix the brokenness in this world because the systems are broken. They're all broken. I hear Christians walking around saying that, that, that we're broken. Christians are not broken. In fact, the word salvation, which means to rescue, it also means sozo in the Greek. It also means to be made whole. God made you whole the moment he saved you. He rescued you from sin and death, and he made you a whole person, a new creation. Christians can feel broken because of the brokenness of this world. But Christians in Christ are not broken. And we've got to start believing that. We've been made whole, but we live in a broken world with broken systems. We saw last week, this is one of the theme verses even of Grace Life Fellowship, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. The me that was broken, the me that was dead, separated from God, got crucified That's what God does. He's into death and resurrection. Christianity is not a self-improvement program. God doesn't take what you were and make it a little better along the way in the hopes that one day you're good enough. That's what religion teaches. That's what the systems of this world teach. Oh, you you just need to improve. You just need to do a little better. And hopefully by the end, your good outweighs your bad, and then God will have mercy on you. Have you ever lived there? That's still what many believe in the church, and it's tragic. The old you got crucified, but look what he says. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's a new I resurrected, a brand new us. The Christian life, really, we hear this, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, To be honest with you, it's not even really a marathon. I mean, the scripture tells us it's a walk. It's a -a walkathon. It's one day after the next, one step after the next, depending upon Him. It's not a sprint, it's not a marathon, it's a daily, moment by moment dependence on Jesus. It's not a do your best. It's not a try your best. And it certainly isn't a just try harder. We saw last week that all those systems that the world purports, all of them start with the wrong foundation. They start with you just improving. Our problem was not just that we did something wrong in the garden. Our problem was that we died there. God said, the day that you eat of this, you shall surely not do wrong you shall surely die. So we said last week, all the world can offer is to button the shirt one after another, but starting with the wrong button. At the end of the day, the shirt's crooked. That's why we see this happening in our world. Man's trying was the failure in the first place. Because in man's trying, he ceased to trust. God had determined, if you'll just believe me, You won't understand all of this, son. Adam, you won't understand all I'm telling you. What did Adam know about death? But if you'll just trust me, when this comes to you, you'll be okay. 
But instead, Adam turned the trust into trying to be like God. And it's that which has gotten us, gotten us into trouble in the first place. It's the essence of religion. And when I use the word religion, I'm using it in the sense of what man attempts to do in order to live for God, in order to get pleasing to God, in order to earn from God. And it's diametrically opposed to what God offers, which is his relationship through Jesus Christ. A a, a death knell to whatever we try to do to get close to God. It is the only way to bridge the gap between God and man, and it is that God would offer himself. That's what Christianity is all about. Even, Even God's perfect law that he gave to Moses... See, Romans 7 tells us that the law was perfect, holy, and good. God gave commandments to Israel. And Israel took those commandments. And they tried to live by them. And what they found was there was no way to find life by the commandments. Unfortunately, the church has not done much differently. We've taken the commandments and thought this is what God expects of us. And this is how we are now to live. But the commandments were never given to Israel as an, as an attempt to get them to live by them. It was to prove their death by them. See, Romans teaches us that the law was given. God's perfect law. It's perfect. It's holy. It's set apart for this purpose. And it's good when it does it. It is set apart for the purpose of revealing to sinful man their lost condition. The law reveals sin. It doesn't remove it. The law entices and exposes sin. It excites sin. 1 Corinthians 15 says, The power of sin is the law. Wet paint, don't touch. What do you want to do? It's because the law was put on you. The law excites something called sin that then drives us to want to break what the law commands. And when God gave the law to Moses, he gave it to reveal to his chosen people that the only way to life would be through a Messiah, not through their own efforts. And yet we failed. We've taken the very ministry that 2 Corinthians calls a ministry of death and condemnation and tried to grab life by it. But 2 Corinthians 3 is clear where Paul tells us we are not ministers of the old covenant The church, the body of Christ, were ministers of a new covenant, a new agreement between God and man, not through the law and a performance basis that only reveals sin, but through Christ on an acceptance basis where he has removed sin. And it says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The purpose of the law was always to excite and expose sin. Somebody may ask, well, then what about all the commandments in the New Testament? It's filled with them. More than 613 commandments in the New Testament. What do we do with them? Well, we see them differently. The imperatives of the New Testament are not just descriptions of, they're not just prescriptions of what we should do. They offer that. We're seeing them right here in this very chapter of Ephesians chapter 4 where it's commanded how we are to walk. It's telling us what we are to do. But if the believer thinks that all God is doing is is doubling down on what didn't work in the first place, we've got to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. God is not expecting us to get it right this time through the commandments. The commandments are wholly different for the believer They are not just prescriptions. They are actually the descriptions of a new life contained within us. The commandments of the New Testament are God's descriptive ways of telling you what the desires of your heart are. Not based on how you feel, not based on what you understand, not based on what the world tells you, but based on the truth of his word. We're going to see it later in chapter 5. He's going to say things like, husbands, love your wife like Christ loves the church. Now, you can take that as a husband and try to make it a prescription in your life. You'll be under the burden and weight of your own insufficiency to accomplish it. And you want proof? Just ask your wife. 
That command is not given to tell you what to go do first. It's actually given to remind you of who you are first. Because we will never, ever, we will never, ever be able to put faith in the commands if we don't know first who God made us to be. So these commands are descriptive. It's about trusting him. It's about a personal relationship by which he gives his life to you so that he can live his life through you. That's what Christianity is about. It's not passivity. It's not waiting for some supernatural feeling to come upon you and then, and then bolting into action. It's not that. This, this supernatural life within us, this, this letting him live his life through us, isn't us being passive or inactive. Faith is very active. It's the active response to what God says. It's believing him, taking him at his word. This this idea of letting Christ live through you is not mystical. I hear people say, well, that's that's too mystical. Like like it's some ethereal idea. How how do I let Christ live through me? I think right here in this very section, Paul is going to give us practical ways in which this actually happens. It's not a supernatural feeling, and it's not some ethereal idea. It's the freedom of practicing walking by the Spirit. And we'll see today just how practical that is. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the truth that sets us free. And I pray for these next few minutes, Father, as we look into your word, that you would confirm to us the truth of your life within us. And that every command that we see, every instruction, imperative, we would know is to be turned back to you by faith. Father, for faithful is the one who calls us and he also will do it. You have not commanded anything from us, Father, that you didn't place first in us the capacity by faith to accomplish. That is why it's so beautiful to be your children, to be in total dependence upon you, Father, that you might live your life through us. We trust you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What I'd like to do is read the, this, the rest of chapter 4, this whole context of this section. And you'll see from verse 25 to 32, Paul's going to basically show us this putting away of the old and this putting on of the new by contrast. And we'll see it. So he says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, that's a putting away of the old, Speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. That's the putting on of the new. For we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing in his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. But let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word which is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. That's the putting off of the old. Along with all malice, be kind to one another. This is the putting on of the new. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Forgiving each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. That's the context of this section. We won't get to all of it today. But I want to show you, this is the putting off of the old, the old way of life, the old manner of life that we were so used to. But now we have learned Christ differently. And being renewed in the spirit of our mind, we put on the new. And we have a new manner of walking, a new way of living And it's consistent with the character of Jesus because it's that very character that was imparted into you. So in in 425, that falsehood, that's the Greek word pseudo. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, it's the word pseudo where we talk about like you're a pseudo this. It it means false or, or not genuine. And Paul is saying we put that aside. All this fakery, all this, all this posing speaking lies, but, but specifically this kind of this posturing that mankind is so good at, this fleshly appearance where we're worried more about what people think about us than what's really there. You've heard it said, character is what you are when nobody's watching. Uh, listen, 
many times, I think, when we talk about putting away falsehood, it's not just not telling lies. It's actually living truth. It's living the truth. Lying is perhaps the most universal characteristic of the old life. Right here, Paul starts with it. Put off the old, put on the new, and then he starts right in on, hey, let's, let's not live in falseness. Let's not speak lies to one another. It's interesting. It's universal because none of us really had to be schooled in how to lie, did we? We all get it. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't really matter uh, who you are or where you live. Lying, lying is a universal characteristic of that old life. Even though we weren't schooled in it, nobody had to teach us how to lie. Many of us have graduated to become PhDs in it, right? Where, where we, we, we can't even find our way through the truth because the lies sit in place to protect us from things. Not only is it a universal characteristic of that old way of life, I would argue that is, it is maybe the most distinguishing characteristic of the enemy. That's where it's all sourced. In John 8, he's called the father of lies. He says he was a liar and a murderer from the very beginning. Satan. It's what he's all about. We saw it in the garden when he lied to Adam and Eve about God. It's who he is. It's what he does. And we picked it up. And we didn't have to be taught it, but we've become really good at it. it, it, it we've learned to lie for self-protection. Deep down, we didn't, we didn't want to be found out, or if we did something wrong, we, want, we didn't want to get in trouble. And so, as Madrian Thomas used to say, a lie became a very present help in trouble. It, 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 was, it was our safety net where I could at least get away with something, and we learned to hide that way. We, we've invented categories of lying. We've found ways to, to see the really big ones and the bad ones and, and ways to categorize the, actually the necessary ones. There's, there's big fat lies. There's bold-faced lies. Those are the ones that are not good. But then these are the, these are the ones we need. These are the ones that help us. These are the ones that, that not only help us, but in some way we think help others. The, the little white lies. You know, when we're asked our opinion about something, but we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. So we don't tell the truth, but it's, it's not a big fat lie. It's not one of those destructive ones. We tell fibs, we misrepresent, exaggerate, deceive, we're dishonest. These are all in an attempt to cover up something. But we didn't learn Christ this way. We've put on a new person We've become new creations. There is no need for you to hide. There is no need for you to lie. It will never be a present help in time of trouble. It will only cause more trouble. It can seem benign, I know. I mean, I, there have been many times where I have, I have justified it in the sense of, well, I didn't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Have you ever done that? I, just, I, I said, that I didn't want to hurt their feelings. As though... Hurting somebody's feelings is a problem if you're telling them the truth. Listen, if somebody's feelings, and all of ours at some point at some, in some way are, I mean, some of our feelings are going to be there. If our feelings are protected and based on a lie, then it isn't the truth that hurts them. It's the lie that does. The truth helps. The truth is redemptive. Now, I'm not saying we walk around and just blurt harsh truth to everybody we see. I'm not suggesting that. Speak the truth in love. But you know what I mean. When Catherine comes to me and says, hey, do you think, and it's something very personal that I know could hurt her if I answer what I really think here. For a silly illustration, I'll give you, hey, do you think these jeans make me look fat? I'm not touching this one. We have to be careful. We have to remember that there's no such thing as a categorization of a level or a degree of a lie. It's where it's sourced. In fact, we live in a society where lying is so entrenched, 
we've deemed it unloving not to do some of these lies. It would be unloving to tell the truth here. They might get offended or they might get hurt. I'm not judging here. We've likely all done this. But the truth spoken in love is never, ever hurtful. It's constructive. It's redemptive. I'm not saying it won't hurt somebody's feelings. But those feelings aren't telling them the truth. And the truth is what sets free. I, have, you, have you ever watched America's Got Talent? Do y'all watch that? You can admit it. We're at Grace Church. I, I'm always amazed. Like the judges, like Simon Cowell, come on. He's hard. He's harsh. But he's not lying. He's not necessarily doing it in love all the time, but he's not lying. And sometimes, some of my favorite episodes are the ones where they show the really horrible auditions. The people that should have never gotten past whoever loved them. <laughs> right? Like when they went to their, their, their mom and dad and said, hey, I want to audition for AGT. And, and they sang something. Mom and dad should not have said, oh, that's so great. How do I help? They should have said, you can't sing at all. I love you. Let's find something else you can do. But it's not that. But if you don't tell them the truth out of the fear of hurting their feelings, which is actually a self-protective idea, it's not that I just don't want to hurt their feelings. It's that I don't want them to reject me. Well, then you'll end up on America's Got Talent, and you can't sing a lick. And now it's not the two people that love you that can protect you. It's a whole world that's just going to laugh at you. Somebody should have told them. I remember going to my mom one day. I was little. And, and I said, Mom, I'm getting a good voice. And I sang something. And she, she jokingly said, oh, yeah, well, when? <laughs> now you see the kind of home I was raised in. <laughs> my mom was like Simon. But we, we've got to tell the truth to people. It's who we are. It's, it's, it's what we're about. It's what sets us free. We saw this verse last week. It's, it says it right there, Colossians chapter 3. Do not lie to one another. Notice there's no category unless it's going to preserve their feelings. Listen, we're going to see here in a little bit. God cares about our feelings, but he doesn't, he's not trying to preserve false feelings based on lies. He's sensitive to us. But it's the truth that sets us free. It's not feeling good especially when we're being lied to or we believe lies. Do not lie to one another. You laid aside that person, that liar, with its evil practices. And you've put on the new self who's being renewed to a true knowledge, a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. And it's just not who you are anymore. It's freedom to tell the truth. And then we see he also says, speak the truth, for we are members of one another. He connects it into the body. Here he's specifically talking about the church, the children of God. But look what he says. Speak the truth. Don't lie to one another because you're members of each other. You, you, can't, you can't get away with this. Not when you're joined together. Not when you're interconnected like this. It, it's, it's not loving. Lying hurts more than yourself. It hurts others, and it hurts the cause of Christ. And no wonder the world struggles with the church when we can't find the way to tell the truth to each other. The idea here is that we're together in this. And the defining characteristic of those who have been brought from death to life is not just that we know the truth, but that we tell the truth and live it. See how practical this is? This is walking by the Spirit. This is not some supernatural feeling that has to come over, to, over me and all of a sudden I'm floating in the space because God's moving. No, this is God telling me the truth about who He is and who I am and me actually just walking in it, walking like it's true, telling the truth and taking the risk that whatever comes when I tell the truth in love will be okay. How would you like a physician that took an exam of you physically, took an MRI, and came back and just told a little white lie about it? 
so that you weren't hurt. It wouldn't be helpful. It, would, it wouldn't be constructive in any way. And in fact, at some point, it would lead to death. God is the great physician. This is a practical walking out according to the Spirit. It's not waiting until some supernatural feeling zaps me. It's, it's, it's walking in the volition of the truth that we believe. He goes on to say, and be angry. I like that. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. This is probably where we'll close today, this passage, because it is so rich. I think if I talk to most Christians, they would say that we need to read this closer. It's supposed to say, and I've heard many Christians teach, we're not supposed to be angry. Be not angry. Don't be angry. That's what I hear from more Christians than not. But actually, this is an imperative. This is a command. This is telling us, be angry. I, I, I think it's part of the image of God in people that he's allowing for here. We are commanded to be angry. We are allowed to be angry. This is the point. The Bible, God, never tells us how we should or shouldn't feel. There are things that happen on this planet because of the curse of sin that will make us angry. And if they didn't make us angry, something is wrong with us. Any loving father hates whatever, I didn't say whoever, whatever hurts his kid. This is part of the image of God for us. Be angry. God doesn't tell us how we should or shouldn't feel. He allows for the humanness of our emotions. Let, let me say it this clearly and this bluntly, because we live in a world that that plays with kid gloves when it comes to the emotions of people where we think the emotions are the most defining characteristic of people and that we have to console only the emotions and we can never speak the truth because of their emotions and it will only cause further damage because they have such damaged emotions. And, while, while, and then we, we, we see that God says, hey, look, I am not emotionless. God is not stoic when it comes to the pain of our emotions. He understands them. He allows for them. This is, this is what I want to tell you. God validates your feelings. He does. And he doesn't do it because he knows all things. He does it because he experienced all things in Christ. Jesus had emotions. And Jesus felt the very same things you feel. Jesus felt anger and Jesus felt, felt anxious and Jesus felt worry. But he didn't live those things. He wasn't, it, those things didn't identify him and he wasn't choosing based on those things. His faith, his trust, his choosing was always in God. But he felt all the things that you felt. He was tempted in every way that you and I are, yet without sin. God gets your emotions and he validates them. He gave us the capacity to experience the full spectrum of emotions. Being a Christian is not some stoic, plastic, unrelatable detachment from our feelings. It just means no matter what, you, what your feelings are and what feelings you have, we get renewed in the spirit of our mind not to let the feeling have us. Do you hear that? It's okay for you to have feelings. Here, it's be angry. But it is not okay for the feelings to have you. God has you. Be angry, but do not sin. There is a righteous anger that is actually a part of the image of God in us. God's anger or his wrath is his settled determination against all that is not of him. God is against all that is against him. That's what love does. 
That's what love is. It is an expression of his love. God's wrath is actually an expression of his love. I, I've, I've referred to it as that, that underside or that backdoor expression of his love. God is love. So every characteristic that emanates from God has to be consistent with that love. Wrath is consistent with his love. It's an expression of it. We'll see more on that in a minute. Now, there's obviously an unrighteous anger. This is typically what we deal with more, by the way. There is a sinful type of anger, one that is selfish and self-protective and self-serving, grudges and bitterness and, and, and those kinds of things. Those are the self-serving angers. These are, this is the anger that, that we use to build up protective layers to, to keep us from being hurt again because we don't like getting hurt. And we think it's, it's defining the boundaries of our personhood. But when it's anger, it actually is imprisoning us. Because not only can we, not only do we keep people at bay with it, we can't be expressed fully. That's a sinful type anger. But I want you to notice it says be angry and do not sin. In the sense... It doesn't matter what the anger is. Because look what he says. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Whether it's a righteous anger or an unrighteous anger, it can all lead to sin if it's undealt with. If we nurse our anger, if we massage our anger, if we don't deal with our anger, whether it originated in righteousness or unrighteousness is irrelevant, it will lead to sin. It will lead to what Hebrew says is a root of bitterness. A root works its way in the whole system. And we will find that we are no longer just angry at whatever it is that we were justified in being angry at or unjustified in our anger. But it won't limit itself to what started it. It will work its way through our whole system. And we'll find that we are just bitter. And we are resentful. Because we didn't deal with this anger. That's what it means when it says, do not sin, do not let the sun go down. This is not some crazy idea that you can get angry early in the morning and you got all day, you can have it. That's not what that means. It, 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 was, a, it was a euphemism of the day, but it literally means to deal with it in a timely fashion or it's going to deal with you. Anger unresolved is going to go somewhere, it's going to do something. We've got to do something with it or we sin. Grudges, resentment, bitterness, rage, these are all signs of undealt with anger. And not doing something about it is going to do something with us. So don't let the sun go down on it. it. Earlier we said that God's wrath is an expression of his love. As a father, I said, I, I hate whatever hurts my kids. It's not the anger that's the problem. It's the not dealing with it. We're going to see, we saw it at the end of this passage. Forgive one another just as Christ has forgiven you. The only remedy I see for anger in Scripture is forgiveness. It's forgiveness from God to us, and it's taking that same forgiveness that was given to us and offering it to others. That's what brings the freedom from anger. That's what helps us deal with our anger. We'll talk more about that next week. Denying God's anger against all unrighteousness or hatred, to say that God doesn't have that or doesn't have anger against injustice and immorality, it doesn't lead to a healthy view of God. When I hear people say that grace means that God is just okay with everything, I hear other people argue, well, wait a minute, what about immorality and injustice and all of the stuff that we see? God's just okay with that. He's so loving and gracious and compassionate. There's nothing, there's nothing going on for that. No, his anger, his wrath is consistent with his compassion for people, his love for people, his grace for people, and his mercy for people. Of course he's angry at that stuff. We saw it clearly in the scriptures I love this passage. I put it all on here, Mark chapter 3, 1 through 5. I wanted to read it because I want you to see that it so beautifully harmonizes God's heart in this. Look what Jesus says. It says, he entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. So, so Jesus confronts this, this man who's sick. His, his hand is paralyzed. 
And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. That's those religious people. That's those Pharisees and those Sadducees. They're trying to trap Jesus, and it's the Sabbath. And they're trying to see, is Jesus going to work on the Sabbath by doing this healing? And it says, so that they might accuse him. That's their point. They want to trap him. They want to accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. I love it. Jesus doesn't care what they're after. He's going to heal this man. And he's not breaking the Sabbath by doing it. Remember, the Sabbath, wasn't, the, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He says, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to, to do harm on the Sabbath to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. So Jesus has gotten them now. In verse 5, after looking around at them with anger, same word. Jesus is looking at these Pharisees with anger. This is that righteous indignation of all that is against his love. And he says, he looked at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. That's the harmonizing of the compassion of God. That's how we understand what God's anger is like. He can be angry at what is unloving, but he's grieved by it. Do you see it's not punitive? It's not, it's not condemning. It's redemptive. This anger of God is always for the redemption that he wants to bring. So he's not only angry, he's grieved at their hardness of heart. Do you see the bigger picture? Mark 10, he was angry when the disciples, knowing that Jesus is on this agenda of going to the cross, he, the People, the crowd are getting in his way, and specifically the little kids are coming up to Jesus, and the disciples are rebuking the little children. And you know what it says? Jesus was angry at the disciples. He, he, he said, stop doing that. Unless you become like one of them, you won't see the kingdom. The disciples thought these kids were getting in the way of Jesus' agenda. Jesus was teaching the disciples that they were his agenda. And if you get in the way of his love for people, he's angry. That's the expression of God's wrath. And so many misunderstand his love in this way. Now, I used to think that God's wrath was, was the idea that we've all heard. It's, it's lightning bolts, and it's thunder, and it's, it's fire and brimstone. That sounds like the anger of God. That's what it is about. It's the idea that if you mess up, God's going to get you. But, but that's not the anger of God. That's, that's the anger of man imposed onto God. Where we sentence people at their, at their moment of failure because we are angry and we, we punish them for it. God doesn't do that. God's not out to get you. In fact... When it comes to his wrath, Romans 1 teaches something radical. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, it's not God's going to get you. It says God gave him over. It's God's going to let you. God's going to let you choose that. See, in his love for you, he's not going to confine you and restrict your choice, even if your choice is, is hurtful, even if it's unloving. Because love by nature can't be forced, and God who is all-powerful is also all love, and he will never force his love upon you. He will let even the, the most sinful choices of man, he will allow for them. Three times in this passage in Romans chapter 1, it says, God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over. All of them are based on a therefore, because all of them are based on that they did not see fit to acknowledge God. So God let them do that. He let them see fit to what they did acknowledge themselves. And that's his love. It's the hardest love of a parent. Listen, I want to be clear. Romans 1 is talking about the unbelieving world. For those who are in the church, for those of us who are believers, there is no wrath of God for us anymore like this. All of that was taken upon Jesus. And, and even that it enlightens us to this incredible manifold wisdom of God. Who else comes up with a plan like this? I say comes up with a plan. God has never, ever scratched his head to try to figure out what to do with us. Christ, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We are not working on plan B. God, in his infinite wisdom, knew how to deal with us. That 
that he would actually use our choice. Not force it. Use our choice to redirect us to himself. Think about it. Only in God's infinite wisdom could this be done. That God would come up with a way that uses the freedom of man's choices, even sinful ones, to express his very own love and sovereignty without diminishing or limiting either. Only God can do that. See, if I were God, I would have immediately overwhelmed and overpowered all the free choices that you people have if you were against me. But I would cease to be love at that moment. Love doesn't do that. And God didn't do that. And then we see that this is ultimately expressed in what Jesus did. Who crucified Jesus? Why did he hang on a cross? Well, look at what Isaiah says. But he was pierced for our transgressions. You realize he was falsely accused and he was wrongly crucified. He died along two thieves. They were justly crucified. Jesus was wrongfully accused and he shouldn't have been crucified. But God didn't re-engineer the choices of man. He didn't limit the choices of sinful man that would crucify Jesus. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2 says, If they, the rulers of that age, had known what was the manifold wisdom of God, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. I tend to believe that means if they had known what was in God's heart and mind for them, what God desired for them, they wouldn't have killed Jesus. But God used this. He let them do it. And he used it for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. In this evil and wrong done to Jesus, God in his manifold wisdom was able to use their choice in his sovereignty to accomplish his will of our freedom in Christ. Only God can do that. He loves us. We'll see next week the rest of this walk in practicality of this putting off the old and putting on the new. But today I hope you hear it. God validates our feelings. But he's telling us the truth. And that truth is not just shown, it is proven in what Jesus did. Father, we thank you for the truth that sets us free. We thank you that you love us so much that you saw fit from eternity past not to sentence us to the death that we chose, but, Father, to use the very thing we chose and to allow for your Son to die in our place. For that death to be upon him so that your love for us would be seen. We thank you forever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.